Good morning and welcome to this week's uh, Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar. And this one is a special event for National Reconciliation Week. And I don't know whether any of you here participated last week in the kickoff for Reconciliation Week, where we uh, we hosted the Wiradjuri Echoes folks out the front and they were sharing knowledge about oakum making, but then we all participated in creating a joint cross-cultural, if you will, uh, painting which you can see displayed in the foyer beside the front door and that in itself was a genuine uh, act of reconciliation and a generous um, invitation to to learn about the culture and actually participate in a cultural event from um, uh, Duncan at Wiradjuri Echoes. So fabulous event. I want to start as we always do by acknowledging that we're meeting on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us online or here today. So this week's seminar is entitled Geoscience Australia's Journey Towards Reconciliation and it's been organised by Geoscience Australia's Reconciliation Action Plan Working Group. It's going to be a little bit different to the usual. We've got six speakers and they'll be speaking live here in the room, but um, one from Larrakia country in Darwin, uh, and that's uh, that's going to be via Teams. And there are two, um, two parts of the presentation that have been pre-recorded. And because there'll be several speakers, um, I'm not going to read out their bios, it'd take too long. Um, they're available in the email that you received uh, when registering. And instead, I'll just give a, a quick summary of what to expect. So Verity Normington will start by giving an overview of uh, Geoscience Australia's Innovate Reconciliation Action Plan. Then we'll have Meredith Orr and she'll talk about building relationships with First Nations Australians and how working with First Nations peoples can enhance our relevance to their needs and be an inclusive national data and knowledge provider to support land, land use decisions and management of country. Then we'll have uh, Amy Peterson talking about how location is the key to everything. Everything happens somewhere and somewhere belongs to someone. People, their stories, relationships, rights and responsibilities in connection with their land, they all connect to place. That'll be followed by Nadej Rollet. Uh, she'll be sharing her experience as a Jarwin secondee working around the Kimberley uh, and use of GA's data there. She'll also speak about her personal reflections and learnings of resilience, strength, courage and broadening horizons. Then we'll have Karol Chanotta uh, who will reflect on his Jarwin secondment in northeast Arnhem Land, specifically the privilege of listening and learning from the Yolnu people and, and, how, to, uh, and how geoscience knowledge has shaped and can shape our engagement. Uh, then we'll finish with Yusin Leigh Cooper uh, presenting with uh, some next steps around GA's reconciliation plan. I'll now invite Verity to the stage to lead off. Thank you, James. Hello, everybody. Um, so for those of you that don't know me or don't know why I'm standing up here, I'm uh, one of the co-chairs with Yusin for the Reconciliation Action Plan Working Group here at Geoscience Australia. So I'm going to quickly take us through GA's wrap and then um, move on to the more of the engagement type things that we do here at GA. So what is a wrap and why do we have one? So I've taken these words straight from Reconciliation Australia's webpage and they, um, this is, you know, I couldn't have said it better myself. So I thought, well, why not just take what they've got? They're the people that know about these things. So it's really um, a, a wrap or a reconciliation action plan is really about enabling, enabling organisations to sustainably and strategically take meaningful action to advance reconciliation. And what I really wanted to highlight there is those words at the bottom of the screen. Reconciliation is about strengthening relationships between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and non-Indigenous peoples for the benefits of all Australians. So our, our Innovate Reconciliation Action Plan, we love to call it just the wrap because it's quicker and less of a mouthful. We had our first wrap, which was the Reflect wrap in 2017 and 2018. We then launched our second wrap, the Innovate wrap in 2021. Now that has just recently finished in April of 2023. Um, so we're going to take you through some of the results of some of the, you know, how we went with that. 
Um, but I wanted to point out first that there are three, oh, sorry, four themes in all wraps, and that is relationships, respect, opportunities, and governance. And I'll just give you a few examples of the types of actions against each of those themes so that when we're looking at the next graph, which is a little bit nerdy, I know, um, you'll understand what each of those themes mean. So for relationships, one of the examples we have as an one of the actions we have that I want to use an example is to explore opportunities to positively influence and drive reconciliation outcomes with external stakeholders, including suppliers and end users of our products and information. Now, a great example of this is all of the amazing Wednesday seminars we've had recently. We've had First Nations people come into GA. Um, they've been here to talk about collaboration and working together, but they've also been able to impart their knowledge through our Wednesday seminars. So that's a fantastic example of how we're building relationships and spreading um, the reconciliation across not only GA, but into our earth science community. Now, under the respect theme, um, I wanted to bring out this one. In collaboration with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders and organisations, we will formally utilise place names and terminology in our work. Now, a great example of that is in, done, has been done in the Space Division. They have had, they, through their engagement with the Waterman Elders in the Northern Territory, they were able to get an official gifting of the name Jinnan, which is what Geoscience Australia uses for the Global Navigation Satellite System, or GNSS, the analysis centre software that they use through that GNS. So this is recognising the First Nations person's extensive knowledge and, and navigation of the Australian continent. The opportunities theme, that's things like continue our supply nation uh, procurement membership and develop and communicate opportunities for goods and services from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander businesses to staff. So every now and then you'll see an internet article pop up about the Indigenous procurement plan or something like that. That's how we are meeting those sorts of actions. And the last one is governance. You probably guessed what that's about. That's about making sure that the RAP working group runs smoothly and is making sure that the actions are being actioned and that the next the, the work being done to generate the next wrap is happening. So now we'll get into a little bit of the nerdy sciencey stuff. So this, if you haven't seen these sorts of charts before, these are called Starbursts. And what this basically does, it's a pie chart, but it uses two different levels. So the inner level is one theme, is the themes, and the outer level is whether we've completed them, the action, they're in progress, or they're stuck, or they're to do. So we have 58 actions in our Innovate Wrap. And currently we have 36 that are complete, which is about 67%, uh, 12 that are in progress and 10 that are either not started or are stuck. So some of those stuck ones are things like COVID happened and we couldn't do what we, what we had planned to do or things like that. So as part of the work that Yusin will talk about later is that we will use those and move those actions into the next iteration of our app. So you can see there that um, the majority of our actions are relationship actions. And some, you know, we are, probably 50% done with those. But this is a little bit better um, explained as to where we are with each of the themes in this one. This is exactly the same data. I've just reversed where those things are. So you can see that complete, we're at 67 complete, which is that big green slosh in the middle. And we've got complete actions in all of the themes, which are the ones around the outside. So this is just a way, different way to show um, where we're at. Just because it's the wrap's completed doesn't mean we can't keep working towards these and we will be doing that until the next wrap has, has, has been launched. So we can still work towards improving these numbers so that we can increase from our 67% complete to something a little bit higher. Um, so what I'm going to do now is to help demonstrate the importance of the wrap actions and working with First Nations towards reconciliation. We'll now hear from some of those people who have been working with the organisation within the organisation and with external organisations to better understand how GA's work can be used by communities to help them build their knowledge um, with working in the data that we collect and the information. So first we're going to hear from Meredith Orr from the Office of Chief Scientist and she's pre-recorded her presentation but I'll let Meredith explain that to you um, and then we'll hear from Amy Peterson in the Space Division who as James said is joining us from Larrakia country up in Darwin via Teams. So I will leave it up to Meredith so hello, I'm joining you remotely, both in time and space, from Junkin Country in Northern Queensland, where on this day, Wednesday 31st of May, a Geoscience Australia team is working with Junkin peoples on a co-designed activity. 
I acknowledge the traditional custodians here of Junkin Country and also for all the lands where Geoscience Australia undertakes its activities and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and community. In this segment, I'll outline a pilot project to build relationships with First Nations Australians for Geoscience Australia. This work has its origins in Geoscience Australia's Innovate Reconciliation Action Plan. Back in 2020, the Reconciliation Action Plan Working Group collected suggestions from staff on how to strengthen relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The staff suggestions overwhelmingly supported acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples' perspectives on the areas of GA's expertise and knowledge, the geology and geography of Australia and undertaking holistic engagement through our Australia-wide geoscience activities to foster mutually beneficial relationships. Examples of the recurring suggestions included delivering data and information back to communities after GA has undertaken its geoscience activities. Also two-way knowledge sharing and acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives in landscapes and earth history and also place names in our publications and other communications. The overarching actions to encompass these suggestions were then incorporated into the Innovate Level Plan uh, given by the two items here on this slide. Given that background, there was then an opportunity when the Reconciliation Action Plan was launched to act on those suggestions. There was scope to incorporate building relationships with First Nations Australians into an existing project in the second phase of the Exploring for the Future program. This was the Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project, which supports the program in establishing relationships and enhancing our engagement, including with remote and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, farmers and rural towns. So I emphasise that this activity is a pilot activity within the Exploring for the Future program. It's piloting relationship building with First Nations Australian organisations with the following objectives. Uh, one is to co-design products with First Nations Australians. In this process, we facilitate the use of Geoscience Australia's place-based information and data. We also bring specialist geoscientific knowledge, data and information to those who welcome the opportunity in the context of helping communities plan for future land use decisions. We're also starting to identify opportunities to work together and incorporate First Nations Australians' perspectives in products, and this is largely uh, in relation to perspectives on land management and caring for country. So our pilot activity is working with two Aboriginal corporations, one land council and one ranger program. I don't want to be mysterious by not naming them here, but I would like to make the point that the directors, coordinators and other representatives of the organisations don't need me to explain their perspectives, reasons for and aspirations in working with Geoscience Australia. At the right time and as the relationships develop, we will hear more and more from First Nations Australians in these organisations about the knowledge and perspectives they would like to share with us and the ways in which we can build mutually beneficial relationships. The process has already started in this forum, Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar series. Recently, perspectives have been shared as public contributions to the knowledge sharing initiative. The first was by Lindley Halliday, Deputy Chair of the Nutabulga Native Title Aboriginal Corporation. Lindley created a buzz of inspiration by demonstrating ways of understanding land and country that are new to many people at Geoscience Australia. So appreciated learning from Kato Muir, Chair of the Wakamudu Aboriginal Corporation, who emphasised the importance of new ways of engaging as we look forward to new types of mapping and of design with traditional owners, which will build new relationships with First Nations Australians. And why are building these new relationships important? If we look to the big picture, Geoscience Australia's work covers the Australian continent. First Nations Australians peoples have recognised land interests over more than half the continent. Geoscience Australia can learn from and work with First Nations Australian peoples to enhance our relevance to their needs and be an inclusive national data and knowledge provider to support land use decisions and management of country. This is the longer term vision that we can work towards using the Re Reconciliation Action Plan framework to guide us through this journey. So I'll hand back to our wrap chairs in the theatre and thanks for listening. So I will um, introduce Amy Peterson in live now. Um, just to help with that. So um, Amy is joining us, as I said, from Darwin, and she's going to speak about um, space divisions work, engaging with First Nations people. Take it away, Amy. Thanks, Verity. I'm just having issues forwarding the slides as well. That's okay, I can do that for you if you like. 
No worries, thanks. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, I am joining from the beautiful Larrakea country, Northern Australia, uh, very uh, rich in First Nations culture. So I feel quite connected to this country and community. Uh, and every day I feel blessed for those that have walked and lived on this country and continue to shape this place that uh, myself and my family call home. Uh, today, I'm presenting a case study of engagement across the National Positioning Infrastructure Capability Project, otherwise known as NPIG. So one of the key deliverables in the establishment of uh, this capability has been the development of an extensive, unified and standardised network of ground reference stations across the nation. In progressing this outcome, we've recognised the need to guarantee or provide certainty that we can operate and maintain this infrastructure for at least the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, and this is in line with our vision of creating a location-enabled Australia, with the location information at the heart of development across the nation. Establishing formal tenure arrangements for ongoing land occupation and access is therefore vital to the success of this project. Thanks, Verity. Everything happens somewhere and somewhere belongs to someone. So location is key. Here at Geoscience Australia, we acquire data at specific known locations. But attached to every location are the people, their stories, tenure history, relationships, rights and responsibilities in connection with that land. We need to firstly understand how we can coexist or work as geoscientists in this environment at these locations securing an interest in land such that we can legally access, use and maintain geoscience observatories with confidence, sensitivity and mutual respect. Throughout our MPIC project, we've worked to establish genuine relationships with Indigenous communities and traditional owners early using first principles of engagement. So that is seeking first to understand before being understood. We believe that on this basis, through respectful and equitable engagement, we can grow and strengthen relationships well into the future and ultimately preserve our investment and this science capability. Uh, just on the slide that we're on, so each of our positioning reference station sites uh, is unique in location, underlying tenure and operational challenges. Our infrastructure sits on Crown land, freehold and Aboriginal freehold lands. We occupy under Crown licences, management reserves, easements and leases. We are but one nation where land and tenure is actually administered at a state and territory level. Underlying all of this are Aboriginal land rights and native title considerations, a very complex tapestry of ownership, interest and opportunity as shown in this image intersecting our own interests. Thanks, Verity. In developing what is recognised as compliant best practice approach for securing land, we've applied knowledge, statutory requirements, uh, consideration of cultural heritage, environmental lands, planning and development constraints into a robust land access framework. And I've certainly spoke about this previously. But again, stakeholder engagement has been at the core of what we do. All aspects of our program have required us to openly engage with our stakeholders. Out on country, we've invested in speaking to the right people, offering opportunities for hosting, working with local communities to develop capacity and sharing our pro how our program can benefit individuals personally and also communities more broadly. Knowledge shared helps form relationships and we want to feel connected to the people who are in fact connected to place. We've met hundreds of people across tens of regional and remote Indigenous communities. We've flown in light aircraft, driven thousands of kilometres on country. We've actively and respectfully engaged at Dukayila, Warburton, Oak Valley, out on the Maralinga, Jarajara lands, in APY lands, and out at Kiwakara on the edge of the Great Dibson Desert in WA, just to name a few. Billy tea, barbecued retail and fresh damper graciously shared with equal amount of personal stories, memories, struggles and insights. We've also met countless prescribed body corporate 
boards online in teams where our agenda item might add to or even feel diminished next to a long list of priorities critical to community life and well-being yet still to be progressed bookending a very long day of board meetings and governance for all involved thanks Freddie. We've discussed the why, the opportunities for using positioning to keep country strong. From its use in monitoring endangered species, cultural burning and managing fire, caring for land and sea country, managing pests and weeds, accurately mapping cultural heritage sites. Mostly these conversations and this shared understanding is centred around maps and spatial data the common language where English is perhaps third or fourth in line. Thanks, Freddy. Working together to shape the how. Partnerships. How can we help com keep communities strong? Through the longevity of our relationships on country, we can aspire to supporting Indigenous jobs and training. At Oak Valley, Carnegie and APY lands, for example, we're explicitly committing to this in our land occupation agreements. We can further provide capability uplift through the Ranger Network, helping people gain skills to establish jobs or careers. Our contractors have also supported local economic development in sourcing, buying and staying locally and using indig local Indigenous subcontractors in the construction of our new infrastructure. The NPIC project has leveraged fee-for-service activities where we rightfully value the unique skills critical to project delivery, from commissioning technical site scoping activities and cultural heritage clearances, cultural monitoring, caretaking and regular site monitoring. We have leveraged the Indigenous procurement policy to stimulate business and economic development and provide Indigenous Australians with more opportunities to participate in the economy. That same economy that NPIC aims to stimulate through innovation. This place or location based positioning capability benefiting those connected to this place. Thanks, Verity. Our engagement at schools across these same remote Indigenous communities has opened our eyes to the power of knowledge sharing in two way science where tradition meets the contemporary. At Kiwakara, deemed one of the most remote locations in all of Australia, the curiosity, spatial intelligence and knowledge of country that we observed through the students is simply astounding. Their superpower. They are so engaged in science, applying Indigenous culture and knowledge in an otherwise Western curriculum. Our privilege to visit, work in and across these lands provide us invaluable insights. We have as much to learn as we have to exchange. And just maybe our genuine and ongoing engagements, efforts across education and outreach and motivation to partner can help inspire big things in these students. Thanks, Freddie. We've also committed to engaging communities beyond project delivery, communicating how our data might be future ready, appropriate and accessible to help in times of need during cyclone and disaster recovery in Northern Australia, for example or used in community mapping projects, motivating a junior or cadet ranger, accelerating our vision to install artwork at every NPIC site on country, and one day soon publishing dual site names in our metadata across 200 stations. Thanks, Freddie. Collectively, in linking our geoscience projects to wrap actions, we don't have to think beyond the possible. We have an obligation to make possible what is right there in front of us, what is the socially responsible and the right thing to do. Simple actions executed well, interwoven and intrinsically delivered through our projects. This is how we action reconciliation at Geoscience Australia. We'll now hear from Nadege Rollet about her valuable experience as a jail and secondi. Thank you. Today, I'm going to share with you some highlight of my Jawun second month. I'm going to share my screen with you. So I undertook a Jawun second month earlier this year in the West Kimberley 
and I will start giving some background about the Jawan program. This Jawan program fosters collaboration between indigenous communities and leaders in partnership between the government, the private sector, and indigenous Australia. It's based on shared values that build relationships between you and your organization and your indigenous partner organization that can be located within 10 communities across Australia. Through this unique experience, you learn about each other that helps create a new culture to help develop some new ways of doing things. This means that you are exposed to new opportunities, you learn different perspectives, and you share your expertise that is hard for indigenous organizations either to get or to invest in. So for me, when I arrived in Broome, uh, it meant like I arrived in a new world, living a very different lifestyle, full of contrast with some challenges and also some hope. I experienced the local Yaru community that weaves people, culture and country together. I also experienced stories shared by people with uh, diverse, um, diverse family heritage when their children were taken away, moved to missions and resulted in the stolen generation. We also heard stories of segregation, like a casting system where they were segregating Aboriginal from Asian and the British. So I really experienced this multicultural community of Broome that also resulted from the uh, pearling industry. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the northern coast of Australia used to harvest and trade pearl shell more than 20,000 years ago, until Europeans uh, were also interested in uh, finding pearls in the 1850s. So this brought a new uh, population of Asian heritage from Japan, China, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and they came to work with Aboriginal people doing this very dangerous work as pearl divers. Women were also blackbirded like kidnapped and forced to do this very dangerous work. So you can see that the melting pot that Broom is today doesn't come without its harsh past. The current condition and um, um, challenges in the community today are very different, but you still feel um, uh, racism and um, discrimination among the community. However, the motivation of the people is the same. It's to keep their culture, their language and their identity alive and strong. This community is very young, full of energy that brings also lots of innovation. And the geology and the landscape is just beautiful. So when I arrived in Broome, I came to work with the Kimberley Land Council. This, this is an organization that works with and for traditional owners of all the Kimberley. Their motivation is to get back their country, look after their country and get control of their future. And you can see that they have been quite successful so far at securing more than 97% of native title across the whole Kimberley region. Now they focus on managing their land, managing their rights and interests with the support of prescribed body corporates, but also uh, 18 ranger programs across the whole region. The Kimberley Land Council also have, has a leading role in amplifying the views and voices of the Kimberley Aboriginal people locally, nationally and internationally. They are also working with other uh, Roger ranger groups uh, across the world to help them regain the culture that they have lost. So you can see that this organization is very much focused on the future to get their mob into the new world, as they say, so to help them to, to adapt to this new world. How do they do it? By keeping passing the knowledge down to the next generation to keep the community strong, but also by expanding their capacity and capability and securing their long-term economic independence uh, through uh, various uh, opportunities and activities for their people. 
However, all of this come with some dependency as they spend lots of time getting the government accountable to their agreements. So while I was at the Kimberley Land Council, I was given two main projects. One was to work across two teams uh, involving some lawyers, anthropologists, uh, rangers, firefighters and traditional owners to map relationship between cultural knowledge of water sources and bodies and Western science of mapping surface and subsurface water connectivity through so the whole region. And my second project was to help develop some geographic layers, uh, capturing some of their knowledge and some of our knowledge and to bring that into a, uh, to start a database. So you can see that this was a very ambitious program that led to some opportunities to develop some long term relationship to be able to achieve those outcomes. However, it also came with some challenges, as now uh, GeoS Australia also has to learn how we can manage cultural information. So why is it important to do this? Because water is becoming increasingly attractive in the region to support the economy, but also the well-being of all living species. And as you can see on the right hand side on the map here, the number of mining tenements are increasing in the region and also the number of um, users in the region using the same water is also increasing. So traditional owners are well aware that they will have to assess potential impact of all this activity on their land and on groundwater. So the value that such secondment brings to the Kimberley Land Council, but also to Geoscience, Geoscience Australia, it's by increasing understanding, our understanding and recognition of their cultural knowledge and values, so we can work better together and make our uh, work more relevant for local indigenous communities. So through this um, process, we have developed potential short-term and longer-term project and uh, uh, also uh, looking at potentially developing an MOU with them. So my personal reflection after such unique experience, it's despite all the challenges that face the, the, this uh, community, you really feel the resilience and courage of the young leaders that help their community to stay strong mentally and physically. And that was a really amazing lesson of life for me to take home. Also, I experienced the passion and commitment of the people. That was uh, very inspiring to see them, how they get uh, their mob to adapt to this new world. Also, knowing that Geoscience Australia has capability and some capacity to help, to contribute to better outcome for indigenous communities, it's very satisfying. And through this experience, I broadened my horizon and also made some new friends and I recommend to continue listening and including indigenous community knowledge in our future work and particularly when we are looking at water allocation plan. So thank you very much and I encourage you to contribute so we can broaden connection between non-indigenous and indigenous Australians. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi everyone, I'm the first speaker internally it seems, right, second. Um, okay, all right, thank you very much. It's a marvel that we can have people join us from all over Australia uh, in the sense, uh, I think it's amazing. Um, so I'm the second speaker who's gonna reflect on a Jarwin secondment. And I wanna start with, I suppose, why I did it. And that's related to my role at, at Geoscience Australia. So I'm the senior science advisor for the Exploring for the Future program. It's our, I suppose, flagship investment into a thing which we call pre-competitive geoscience. So geoscience that we collect to inform decision-making for the responsible management of resources or information we provide to companies ahead of their rivalrous activity in exploration. Um, I've been here for 20 years or so. Uh, in the first decade, I spent a lot of time out back, uh, in outback Australia. I had the privilege of going to lots and lots of mines and staying in lots and lots of communities. And when I was doing this, it always struck me that there's this great, in a sense, cultural disparity between the two, 
Um, there's certainly kind of the questions of redistribution of wealth in terms of the wealth that's coming out of the mines and what you see in the communities. But more importantly, I think there's this cultural element to it. And I thought that to progress, I think there's a very strong relational aspect to this. So when James sent out a call, you know, who's going to apply for a Jowans economy and I read up about it, I thought, oh, this is something that, I, that I'd like to give a go because at its core, it's relational. Jowan means friend and the organisation is really well respected. I was surprised at how many doors it opens and the opportunities that it provides for us to get to know the places where we get seconded into. So where did I go? Northeast Island land. It's a, about an hour's flight east of Darwin. I think it's about 700 kilometres in a straight line. I haven't really calculated it. Um, it's right there on the very tip um, out in the Gulf of Carpentaria. It's magical country. I've never seen more beautiful beaches that you can't get in because of the crocs. Um, uh, the place where I was based and working was the town of Nulmboy. It's got about 3,000 uh, people in it. And I'll get back to its history in a little bit later. And I was living in community at Yirikala. It has about 800 people. Uh, so it was a great, great privilege uh, to, uh, to go there. I was seconded to the Dimuru Aboriginal Rangers, which are one of the first Aboriginal um, ranger groups established in the whole country back in the 1990s. So not very long ago, really. Uh, they're very well respected. And they taught me a whole heap of what it means to have priorities which the Yulmu people, the custodians of country, have for the indigenous protected area they look after. Uh, it covers about 1,500 square kilometres and it's about three times larger offshore. So it has an onshore and an offshore component, which was very rich to me. And right in the middle of it is a mining lease. The mining lease at the moment is by Rio Tinto. Uh, they actually, um, the, the town is part of it. Uh, they maintain the infrastructure, the power uh, there, the, the, the water, the, um, uh, they subsidised the Woolworths. So all the amenities uh, they look after and a lot of the homelands which are spread out across this region kind of depend on these things. You know, there's a hospital there also and the mine is closing down in less than five years is the plan at the moment. The refinery is already closed. So the community is going through a great transition. And for me, it was a great insight. I'm normally focused about how do you find the resource to kind of, you know, to, to develop it for all the net zero transition needs that we that, that we need, but there is a time after it uh, that comes. Um, so uh, it, it was great to talk to the range in terms of you know what they do, and their work fundamentally is spatial. That's what Geoscience Australia does, right? So there was a kind of like a natural kind of language there. Um, the map that you can see, I, I pulled this off from Digital Earth Australia and kind of presented it this way. Uh, you can see mostly woodlands and so on, but the interesting bits happen in the small bits, the, the colours that you can't see, um, the tidal zones, the, the aquatic vegetation, uh, those sorts of areas uh, where a lot of their effort goes into caring for country. Now, when I was there, I was helping with geospatial things, but I also had the privilege of being part of their plan of management workshops. Uh, they were going out and asking the Yungmu, what do you want of the Aboriginal rangers? What do you view as their role? What should they be doing to look after country the best way they can? So I got to sit and listen and learn from all those things. And at the end, I got an opportunity to present some of the data sets that may be of use to them. Now, this is where I thank the Digital Earth Australia team. I relied heavily on your information because these were some of the questions that were coming up. What are the consequences of climate change, of sea level rise? How healthy are the mangroves? Turns out they're actually very healthy in this particular area. Um, and in that process, we're kind of zooming around, looking at different areas. And this is one area that we ended up discussing. It's the beach at Yirrkala, where I was living. So I got to walk down and take this picture here. And for the last 10 years, the coastline has been coming closer and closer to the houses that you can see there. Um, uh, one of the elders came along to the workshops also. I got to speak to him uh, later on about this. And the community says, well, this is great. You can tell us what's happening, but we can we can see that. Why is it happening? What can we do about it? 
Sherry, uh, it's similar questions that we get from our management. You've collected all this data. What does it mean for the resource potential of a region or for the groundwater? So I thought, oh gosh, this is a hard question. You know, I don't do really cost term geomorphology much. But in time, it turned out that using that satellite information that we collect, it turns out there was a change in the land management practices in the catchment region. And that coincided with the start of the erosion. This is the only part that was eroding. And it looks as if the sediment supply into those creeks has most likely been restricted. And I went and checked that with the people who were living in those houses and said, yes, actually, you know what? We have noticed there's less of sediment supply into, you know, coming in. So that's the sediment that you need to, shop the, to stop the longshore drift from kind of uh, erosion. Anyway, we talked to the various people who were engaged in those uh, in, uh, in managing country in those areas, and I hope you know that, that they'll be able to put things, um, use this information to good use. Um, that's just one example of the type of data sets and type of information that I was able uh, to share. Um, at the end, though, I couldn't help my kind of urges to kind of share about the rocks themselves across the region. So we kind of gave the kind of a lecture of every rock type that's in the IPA. Um, <laughs> it was a long presentation. Um, we had some great discussions in it. Again, similar questions. This is all very well. These are the rocks. These are the data sets. That's all great. But where are the areas that have the potential for future resources? Um, how do they correspond to the areas of biodiversity across the region that we need to protect and make sure the country is healthy? All right? And I think these are all things that we're trying to get to, and that's actually what we're trying to do as part of exploring for the future out of a project which internally we're calling GeoRapper, so that we can translate the raw data sets that we provide into what are the implications for, for the resources in the region. But at the end of the meeting, there was a piercing comment made by Raul, uh, who's sitting just down. This is Raul. He's, uh, he's the senior cultural advisor for Dimaru. And he said, that was great. I wished that you had given this talk in 1952. And like, oh man, that was like a, that was a heavy moment. The reason he said this is this. BMR, our predecessor organisation, back in 1952, released a report about the bauxite resources across that region. It was in response to a sample that we got from Colonel Wells, who had landed in the, at the airstrip there, and he picked up some bauxite. Now, there's some bauxite just down here uh, that I was able to pick up. It's, it's everywhere across the region. And, uh, and, and, that's, uh, and there's a mine there now. Uh, mining it, All right? So this is why Rio Tinto uh, is there. And you can, Digital Earth Australia allows us to see the progress of this mine. Uh, you can see the clearing of vegetation. You can even see the rehabilitation options uh, afterwards. And as it goes on, you'll see that it starts to accelerate at a certain point. That's when they realised that there was no more, they couldn't make the economics of the refinery work because of the energy supply in the area. So now they're mining and shipping, so to speak. Um, and you can see that as the mine develops, it effectively maps out what this guy, H.P. Owens from BMR mapped out in just three days across the region. He, uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, and there is also another incredible thing down here in the bottom, that is uh, the mining by Gukla Mine. It's the only owned and operated Aboriginal mine that I know of in Australia. Um, so there, it's a very small part of the resource. Uh, Rio Tinto can't get the big instruments in there, so they've got smaller instruments and doing an amazing job. It was a great privilege to be there. And right next to it is the Gama site. So that's where Anthony Albanese announced the voice to parliament uh, referendum. Uh, and one of the samples that is going around is actually from that site. Uh, itself. So why did Raul say, I wish he had given it to us in 1952? Maybe this is a positive story so far. Well, it turned out that it wasn't. You see, in 1963, the Prime Minister announced the excision of the ground around this area for exploration and mining. And the Yungu, especially those who were based in Yirkala at the time, were not consulted. 
So uh, there are eight points to this, uh, to, to, to a petition, which they then wrote to Parliament. It's immensely significant. It was the first traditional document to have been recognised by the Commonwealth Parliament. It's, in a sense, a fusion of both traditional law, because it lays out grievances based on that, and the Commonwealth law. It was presented in duplicate uh, with two different styles of painting around it, which represent the Dua and the Yircha Moites. Everything in the world is divided into these two for the Yung. It was written in Yunumata, their language, and in English. And it resulted in a cascade of events. There were committees, um, uh, there were, uh, there were, um, uh, there, there was legal action uh, uh, that, that followed, but in the end, it resulted in the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, which the Northern Territory operates to to this day. And uh, the great Unipingu, who recently passed away, was the person who helped scribe it and translate it and promulgate these actions. And it's generally regarded that without this, perhaps the Mabo decision would not have happened. And uh, and a native title. Land rights are front and centre when you go there. I was living in Yirikala and this is the painting on, on, the, uh, uh, on the shop there and this is what I looked out of my window every day. All right, it's celebrating effectively the Aboriginal Land Rights uh, Act in 1976. But as I reflected on these tenements and on Raoul's comments, uh, on, these, uh, on these events and Raoul's comments, if you read the second grievance of the petition, it says that the proceedings of the excision of this land and the fate of the people on it were never explained to them beforehand and were kept secret from them. And that makes me think, how good are we at returning the so what information that the young, most of Aboriginal people want from us? Um, if you go reading, you'll find that they didn't know about the 1952 report from BMR until 1963. So as a result of that, I suppose as part of the Exploring for the Future program, we've tried to, I suppose, I suppose restart our engagement uh, in some of the areas that we've worked and done significant work in, uh, in Australia as a result of this, which got stalled because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and I really want to thank Jeanette, especially, and Margie uh, for helping us to do this. But we've got so much more to share. And I think the talks so far today have highlighted this. There were so many other things that I got to share in sort of a day here or there and in conversations, uh, sometimes just over, uh, just over uh, a morning coffee uh, with other organisations uh, up in Northeast Arnhem Land. We can share what is the history of, of sea level change uh, across the range. That's written into the rock record. Um, I could go and pass on geoscience information to Gukla, who actually has picked up exploration tenements. You know, we kind of think to ourselves, what is the perception of, uh, of the communities towards mining? It turns out they're not anti-mining itself. They're anti-being exploited, right? They want partnerships. And I think we need to keep dwelling about how can we establish those partnerships, even as part of that pre-competitive, that very early geoscience work that we do. I got to pass on some information. I also got to sample uh, the, the mine to see if there's any critical minerals, for example, in those ores. And as the community transitions away from mining, which is closing the region, the questions are what next? And it may well be that there's a green hydrogen future there. I got put forward, surely we won't be prospective for green hydrogen. You need solar panels, wind. Look at the overcast sky that we've got around here. It was so helpful to be able to dial up the, uh, the, um, the HEF tool and show that actually, you know what? You are economic. You're not the most economic region, but you are. And perhaps if we knew that and had the resolve to do this, maybe the refinery would be still going in the, across the region. Okay, so my takeaway points for, uh, for this talk. I think GA has an enormous amount of valuable information and skills to share. And I think the onus to provide meaningful, 
information is on us. That so what question, what can we do with this information in a way that decision makers can use? But in order to provide the meaningful information, we need to listen and learn what is of importance to the communities. Now, uh, thank you very much for listening to, to, to me go on. And uh, I also just want to thank Dimaru, especially the Yuna community, especially Rhonda uh, Yunapingu for um, introducing me to the culture in, in the region. Uh, Matthew Keith from Jowan, an amazing facilitator at his job, he's fantastic. And last of all, I think I mentioned the other people, I just want to thank Andrew Heap actually. And the reason for it is when I was about to leave, I was like, oh, I've got all this work to do. Um, you know, I'm going to take this with me. Don't worry, you know, I'll keep going with it. And in a side conversation in the corridor, he said, look, just just, just let it go um, and let yourself be immersed. I'm not sure if he even remembers the conversation, but it was very useful for me <laughs> um, uh, because that's what I did and it was enormously beneficial. And I think it also reflects the support for the RAP uh, from senior management at GA. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks. Okay, right. Righty. I'm just going to try and wrap this up and try and kind of show how our learnings from the past are so important to take us to the future. So just a little bit of a reflection on, on the painting that we've showed quite a bit, and some of you might have seen it. It's outside the executive in level two. It's a beautiful piece, um, and it tends to highlight the importance of nurturing um, our nation's environment for future generations. It, it talks to the heart of what Geoscience Australia is, you know, the, 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 the land and, and the ocean. Um, and that was commissioned for us in 2018 as part of our, as of our reconciliation action plan that, that's come to an end in April 2013. So let's talk about that. The past, we're moving on to, on to the next. Um, so I think something that is very important in, in, and we would see that through everyone's presentations here, how there's been a bit of a shift of culture. And I think that that's, that's crucial. That, that'll take us very, to very important places, I think. Um, and this, it's, for me, it was really important being part of, of this because we spend a lot of time here and being proud of the organization you work for and the values it represents is something that will, without doubt, make us um, want to be here and, and try and share our experience with the people that sit next to us, right? So I think it's very crucial that we understand what the mission of Geoscience Australia is. And most of you would know that we uh, our mission is to be the trusted sort of information of Australia's geology and geography, right? But the importance of understanding that um, uh, this has been preceded by thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of uh, First Nations, um, Aboriginal, Torres Strait um, Island people is very important. It's very humbling, isn't it? So I'd, I'd like you guys to think about that. Um, so one other thing that, that has come through, I hope, through the conversations is how our work covers activities on land and water. And just with a lot of the, the last reflections by Carol and Nadesh, for instance, about how the Torres Strait and Aboriginal people have um, rights and interests on, on, on the work we, we do and, and over the lands we acquire our data sets and the knowledge we add. So we need to understand and appreciate also their knowledge and their perspectives to move on. Um, I'm just going to finish a little bit on one of the, on the notes by Reconciliation Australia that has um, talked about the importance of some of the recent events that happened with um, with people like Stan Grant, who was part of the ABC, and Dan Boucher, who gave a talk here at the GA, being subject to some 
really kind of huh, without uh, like racism let's let's say it and racism is a crime it's it's cataloged so it's unacceptable we should have this debate here and maybe we have a reflection about that um but i think as we started the 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 changing culture in organization in an organization which is what i firmly believe ga is going through is um a way we'll set expectations of how our people behave and i think that that is kind of the line where we stand. And um, these cultural change can break down a lot of boundaries. So let's continue on that on that journey. Um, we are developing the next rep and I invite everyone here and online to be part of it. There's many activities when you're out planning your next projects, take these these little reflections into account. So I'll just invite James to finish up and thank you for, for that. Yeah. I think we can see if there's any questions coming, James. No, sorry. Well, I don't know about you, but I found that a really affecting presentation. As CEO, I'm immensely proud of every one of you for what you've contributed here. And on behalf of the organisation as CEO, I want to express our collective gratitude for what you've provided today because not only is it observational and, and interesting in its own right, the cause it gives us all to reflect on how the work we do can and should be utilised to serve all Australians. And now we're talking about a, a cohort, uh, the First Nations people of Australia, who traditionally we have not necessarily well, we certainly haven't reached and made our information and data useful. Um, and maybe in the past, we haven't even thought about wanting to. Now, we definitely do want to. It's a direction we're headed. It's important. It's important for this country. So thank you so much for all that you've done. Let's just give them a massive round of applause. Here. Well done. I just want to let you know what is in store next week uh, for the Wednesday seminar. We will have a presenter from the ANU, Dr. Zach uh, Sudholtz, and he will be talking about mapping Australia's lithospheric mantle, and that's a part of the Exploring for the Future program. I hope you've got a lot out of today. I certainly have. Thanks, everyone.